The History of Alibaba and of the 40 Robbers Killed by One Slave by Arabian Nights Entertainment. Part 2 The captain, finding that their design had proved abortive, went directly to the place of meeting and told his troop that they had lost their labor and must return to their cave. He himself set the example, and they all returned as they had come. When the troop was all got together, the captain told them the reason of their returning, and presently the conductor was declared by all worthy of death. He condemned himself, acknowledging that he ought to have taken better precaution, and prepared to receive the stroke from him who was appointed to cut off his head. But as the safety of the troop required the discovery of the second intruder into the cave, another of the gang, who promised himself he should succeed better, presented himself, and his offer being accepted, he went and corrupted Baba Mustafa, as the other had done, and being shown the house, marked it in a place more remote from sight with red chalk. Not long after, Morgiana, whose eyes nothing could escape, went out and, seeing the red chalk, and arguing with herself, as she had done before, marked the other neighbors' houses in the same place and manner. The robber, at his return to his company, valued himself much on the precaution he had taken, which he looked upon as an infallible way of distinguishing Ali Baba's house from the others, and the captain and all of them thought it must succeed. They conveyed themselves into the town with the same precaution as before, but when the robber and his captain came to the street, they found the same difficulty at which the captain was enraged, and the robber in as great confusion as his predecessor. Thus the captain and his troop were forced to retire a second time, and much more dissatisfied, while the robber, who had been the author of the mistake, underwent the same punishment, to which he willingly submitted. The captain, having lost two brave fellows of his troop, was afraid of diminishing it too much by pursuing this plan to get information of the residence of their plunderer. He found by their example that their heads were not so good as their hands on such occasions, and therefore resolved to take upon himself the important commission. Accordingly, he went and addressed himself to Baba Mustafa, who did him the same service he had done to the other robbers. He did not set any particular mark on the house, but examined and observed it so carefully by passing often by it, that it was impossible for him to mistake it. The captain, well satisfied with his attempt, and informed of what he wanted to know, returned to the forest, and when he came into the cave, where the troop waited for him, said, Now, comrades, nothing can prevent our full revenge, as I am certain of the house, and in my way hither I have thought how to put it into execution. But if anyone can form a better expedient, let him communicate it. He then told them his contrivance, and, as they approved of it, ordered them to go into the villages about and buy nineteen mules with thirty-eight large leather jars, one full of oil, and the others empty. In two or three days' time, the robbers had purchased the mules and jars, and as the mouths of the jars were rather too narrow for his purpose, the captain caused them to be widened and after having put one of his men into each, with the weapons which he thought fit, leaving open the seam which had been undone to leave them room to breathe, he rubbed the jars on the outside with oil from the full vessel. Things being thus prepared, when the nineteen mules were loaded with thirty-seven robbers in jars and the jar of oil, the captain, as their driver, set out with them, and reached the town by the dusk of the evening, as he had intended. He led them through the streets till he came to Ali Baba's, at whose door he designed to have knocked, but was prevented by his sitting there after supper to take a little fresh air. He stopped his mules, addressed himself to him, and said, I have brought some oil a great way to sell at tomorrow's market, and it is now so late that I do not know where to lodge. If I should not be troublesome to you, do me the favor to let me pass the night with you, and I shall be very much obliged by your hospitality. Though Ali Baba had seen the captain of the robbers in the forest, and had heard him speak, it was impossible to know him in the disguise of an oil merchant. 
He told him he should be welcome, and immediately opened his gates for the mules to go into the yard. At the same time, he called to a slave and ordered him, when the mules were unloaded, to put them into the stable and to feed them, and then went to Morgiana to bid her get a good supper for his guest. After they had finished supper, Ali Baba, charging Morgiana afresh to take care of his guest, said to her, "'Tomorrow morning I design to go to the bath before day. Take care of my bathing linen, be ready. Give them to Abdallah, which was the slave's name, and make me some good broth against my return.' After this he went to bed. In the meantime, the captain of the robbers went into the yard and took off the lid of each jar and gave his people orders what to do. Beginning at the first jar and so on to the last, he said to each man, As soon as I throw some stones out of the chamber window where I lie, do not fail to come out, and I will immediately join you. After this he returned into the house, when Morgiana, taking up a light, conducted him to his chamber, where she left him. And he, to avoid any suspicion, put the light out soon after, and laid himself down in his clothes, that he might be the more ready to rise. Morgiana, remembering Ali Baba's orders, got his bathing linen ready, and ordered Abdallah to set on the pot for the broth. But while she was preparing it, the lamp went out, and there was no more oil in the house, nor any candles. What to do, she did not know, for the broth must be made. Abdallah, seeing her very uneasy, said, Do not fret and tease yourself, but go into the yard and take some oil out of one of the jars. Morgana thanked Abdallah for his advice, took the oil pot, and went into the yard, when, as she came nigh the first jar, the robber within said softly, Is it time? Though naturally much surprised at finding a man in the jar instead of the oil she wanted, she immediately felt the importance of keeping silence, as Ali Baba, his family, and herself were in great danger, and collecting herself, without showing the least emotion, she answered, <coughs> Not yet, but presently. She went quietly in this manner to all the jars, giving the same answer till she came to the jar of oil. By this means, Morgiana found that her master, Ali Baba, had admitted thirty-eight robbers into his house, and that this pretended oil merchant was their captain. She made what haste she could to fill her oil pot and returned to her kitchen where, as soon as she had lighted her lamp, she took a great kettle and went again to the oil jar, filled the kettle, set it on a large wood fire, and as soon as it boiled, went and poured enough into every jar to stifle and destroy the robber within. When this action worthy of the courage of Morgiana was executed without any noise as she had projected, she returned into the kitchen with an empty kettle, and having put out the great fire she had made to boil the oil, and leaving just enough to make the broth, put out the lamp also, and remained silent, resolving not to go to rest till she had observed what might follow through a window of the kitchen which opened into the yard. She had not waited long before the captain of the robbers got up, opened the window, and, finding no light and hearing no noise or anyone stirring in the house, gave the appointed signal by throwing little stones, several of which hit the jars, as he doubted not by the sound they gave. He then listened, but not hearing or perceiving anything whereby he could judge that his companions stirred, he began to grow very uneasy threw stones again a second and also a third time, and could not comprehend the reason that none of them should answer his signal. Much alarmed, he went softly down into the yard, and going to the first jar while asking the robber, whom he thought alive, if he was in readiness, smelt the hot boiled oil, which sent forth a steam out of the jar. Hence he suspected that his plot to murder Ali Baba and plunder his house was discovered Examining all the jars, one after another, he found that all his gang were dead, and enraged to despair at having failed in his design, he forced the lock of a door that led from the yard to the garden, and climbing over the walls, made his escape. When Morgiana saw him depart, she went to bed, satisfied and pleased to have succeeded so well in saving her master and family. 
Ali Baba rose before day and, followed by his slave, went to the baths, entirely ignorant of the important event which had happened at home. When he returned from the baths, he was very much surprised to see the oil jars and that the merchant was not gone with the mules. He asked Morgiana, who opened the door, the reason of it. My good master, answered she, God preserve you and all your family. You will be better informed of what you wish to know when you have seen what I have to show you, if you will follow me. As soon as Morgiana had shut the door, Ali Baba followed her, when she requested him to look into the first jar and see if there was any oil. Ali Baba did so, and seeing a man started back in alarm and cried out. Do not be afraid, said Morgiana. The man you see there can neither do you nor anybody else any harm. He is dead. Oh, Morgiana, said Ali Baba. What is it you show me? Explain yourself. I will, replied Morgiana. Moderate your astonishment, and do not excite the curiosity of your neighbors, for it is of great importance to keep this affair secret. Look into all the other jars. Ali Baba examined all the other jars, one after another, and when he came to that which had the oil in it, found it prodigiously sunk, and stood for some time motionless, sometimes looking at the jars, and sometimes at Morgiana, without saying a word. So great was his surprise. At last, when he had recovered himself, he said, And what has become of the merchant? A merchant, answered she. He is as much a one as I am. I will tell you who he is, and what has become of him. But you had better hear the story in your own chamber, for it is time for your health that you had your broth after your bathing. Morgiana then told him all she had done from the first observing the mark upon the house to the destruction of the robbers and the flight of their captain. On hearing of these brave deeds from the lips of Morgiana, Ali Baba said to her, God, by your means, has delivered me from the snares these robbers laid for my destruction. I owe therefore my life to you, and for the first token of my acknowledgment, give you your liberty from this moment, till I can complete your recompense as I intend. Ali Baba's garden was very long and shaded at the further end by a great number of large trees. Near these, he and the slave Abdallah dug a trench long and wide enough to hold the bodies of the robbers. And as the earth was light, they were not long in doing it. When this was done, Ali Baba hid the jars and weapons. And as he had no occasion for the mules, he sent them at different times to be sold in the market by his slave. While Ali Baba took these measures, the captain of the forty robbers returned to the forest with inconceivable mortification. He did not stay long. The loneliness of the gloomy cavern became frightful to him. He determined, however, to avenge the fate of his companions and to accomplish the death of Ali Baba. For this purpose, he returned to the town and took a lodging in a khan and disguised himself as a merchant in silks. Under this assumed character, he gradually conveyed a great many sorts of rich stuffs and fine linen to his lodging from the cavern but with all the necessary precautions to conceal the place whence he brought them. In order to dispose of the merchandise, when he had thus amassed them together, he took a warehouse, which happened to be opposite to Cassim's, which Ali Baba's son had occupied since the death of his uncle. He took the name of Kojia Hussein, and, as a newcomer, was, according to custom, extremely civil and complacent to all the merchants, his neighbors. Ali Baba's son was, from his vicinity, one of the first to converse with Kojia Hussein, who strove to cultivate his friendship more particularly. Two or three days after he was settled, Ali Baba came to see his son, and the captain of the robbers recognized him at once, and soon learned from his son who he was. After this, he increased his assiduities, caressed him in the most engaging manner, made him some small presents, and often asked him to dine and sup with him when he treated him very handsomely. Ali Baba's son did not choose to lie under such obligation to Kojia Hussein, but was so much straitened for want of room in his house that he could not entertain him. 
He therefore acquainted his father, Ali Baba, with his wish to invite him in return. Ali Baba, with great pleasure, took the treat upon himself. Son, said he, tomorrow being Friday, which is a day that the shops of such great merchants as Kojia Hussein and yourself are shut, get him to accompany you, and as you pass by my door, call in. I will go and order Morgiana to provide a supper. The next day, Ali Baba's son and Kojia Hussein met by appointment, took their walk, and as they returned, Ali Baba's son led Kojia Hussein through the street where his father lived, and when they came to the house, stopped and knocked at the door. This, sir, said he, is my father's house, who from the account I have given him of your friendship charged me to procure him the honor of your acquaintance, and I desire you to add this pleasure to those for which I am already indebted to you. Though it was the sole aim of Kojia Hussein to introduce himself into Ali Baba's house that he might kill him without hazarding his own life or making any noise, yet he excused himself and offered to take his leave. But a slave, having opened the door, Ali Baba's son took him obligingly by the hand and in a manner forced him in. Ali Baba received Kojia Hussein with a smiling countenance and in the most obliging manner he could wish. He thanked him for all the favors he had done his son, adding with all the obligation was the greater, as he was a young man, not much acquainted with the world, and that he might contribute to his information. Kojia Hussein returned the compliment by assuring Ali Baba that though his son might not have acquired the experience of older men, he had good sense equal to the experience of many others. After a little more conversation on different subjects, he offered again to take his leave, when Ali Baba, stopping him, said, Where are you going, sir, in so much haste? I beg you would do me the honor to sup with me, though my entertainment might not be worthy of your acceptance. As such as it is, I heartily offer it. Oh, sir, replied Kojia Hussein, I am thoroughly persuaded of your good will, but the truth is... I can eat no victuals that have any salt in them. Therefore, judge how I should feel at your table. If that is the only reason, said Ali Baba, it ought not to deprive me of the honor of your company. For, in the first place, there is no salt ever put into my bread. And as to the meat we shall have tonight, I promise you there shall be none in that. Therefore, you must do me the favor to stay. I will return immediately." Ali Baba went into the kitchen and ordered Morgiana to put no salt in the meat that was to be dressed that night, and to make quickly two or three ragouts besides what he had ordered, but be sure to put no salt in them. Morgiana, who was always ready to obey her master, could not help being surprised at his strange order. "'Who is this strange man?' said she. "'Who eats no salt with his meat? Your supper will be spoiled if I keep it back so long.' Well, do not be angry, Morgiana, replied Ali Baba. He is an honest man, therefore do as I bid you. Morgiana obeyed, though with no little reluctance, and had a curiosity to see this man who ate no salt. To this end, when she had finished what she had to do in the kitchen, she helped Abdallah to carry up the dishes, and looking at Kojia Hussein, knew him at first sight, notwithstanding his disguise, to be the captain of the robbers, and examining him very carefully, perceived that he had a dagger under his garment. I am not the least amazed, she said to herself, that this wicked man, who is my master's greatest enemy, would eat no salt with him, since he intends to assassinate him, but I will prevent him. Morgiana, while they were at supper, determined in her own mind to execute one of the boldest acts ever mediated. When Abdallah came for the dessert of fruit and had put it up with the wine and glasses before Ali Baba, Morgana retired, dressed herself neatly with a suitable headdress like a dancer, girded her waist with a silver gilt girdle to which there hung a poniard with a hilt and guard of the same metal, and put a handsome mask on her face. When she had thus disguised herself, she said to Abdallah, Take your tabar, and let us go divert our master and his son's friend as we do sometimes when he is alone. Abdallah took his tabor and played all the way into the hall before Morgiana, 
who, when she came to the door, made a low obeisance by way of asking leave to exhibit her skill while Abdallah left off playing. Come in, Morgiana, said Ali Baba, and let Kojia Hussein see what you can do, that he may tell us what he thinks of your performance. Kojia Hussein, who did not expect this diversion after supper, began to fear he should not be able to take advantage of the opportunity he thought he had found, but hoped, if he now missed his aim, to secure it another time by keeping up a friendly correspondence with the father and son. Therefore, though he could have wished Ali Baba would have declined the dance, he pretended to be obliged to him for it, and had the complacence to express his satisfaction at what he said, which pleased his host. As soon as Abdallah saw that Ali Baba and Kodia Hussein had done talking, he began to play on the tabor, and accompanied it with an air to which Morgiana, who was an excellent performer, danced in such a manner as would have created admiration in any company. After she had danced several dances with much grace, she drew the poniard, and holding it in her hand, began a dance in which she outdid herself by the many different figures, light movements, and the surprising leaps and wonderful exertions with which she accompanied it. Sometimes she presented the poniard to one breast, sometimes to another, and oftentimes seemed to strike her own. At last, she snatched the tabor from Abdallah with her left hand, and holding the dagger in her right, presented the other side of the tabor, after the manner of those who get a livelihood by dancing, and solicit the liberality of the spectators. Ali Baba put a piece of gold into the tabor, as did his son, and Kojia Hussein, seeing that she was coming to him, had pulled his purse out of his bosom to make her a present. But while he was putting his hand into it, Morgiana, with a courage and resolution worthy of herself, plunged the poniard into his heart. Ali Baba and his son, shocked at this action, cried out aloud. Unhappy woman, exclaimed Ali Baba, what have you done to ruin me and my family? It was to preserve, not to ruin you, answered Morgiana, for see here, continued she, opening the pretended Kojia Hussein's garment, and showing the dagger, what an enemy you had entertained. Look well at him, and you will find him to be both the fictitious oil merchant and the captain of the gang of forty robbers. Remember, too, that he would eat no salt with you, and what would you have more to persuade you of his wicked design? Before I saw him, I suspected him as soon as you told me you had such a guest. I knew him, and you now find that my suspicion was not groundless. Ali Baba, who immediately felt the new obligation he had to Morgiana for saving his life a second time, embraced her. Morgiana, said he, I gave you your liberty and then promised you that my gratitude should not stop there, but that I would soon give you higher proofs of its sincerity, which I now do by making you my daughter-in-law. Then, addressing himself to his son, he said, I believe you, son, to be so dutiful a child that you will not refuse Morgiana for your wife. You see that Kojia Hussein sought your friendship with a treacherous design to take away my life, and if he had succeeded, there is no doubt, but he would have sacrificed you also to his revenge. Consider that by marrying Morgiana, you marry the preserver of my family and your own. The son far from showing any dislike, readily consented to the marriage, not only because he would not disobey his father, but also because it was agreeable to his inclination. After this, they thought of burying the captain of the robbers with his comrades, and did it so privately that nobody discovered their bones till many years after, when no one had any concern in the publication of this remarkable history. A few days afterward, Ali Baba celebrated the nuptials of his son and Morgiana with great solemnity, a sumptuous feast, and the usual dancing and spectacles, and had the satisfaction to see that his friends and neighbors, whom he invited, had no knowledge of the true motives of the marriage, but that those who were not unacquainted with Morgiana's good qualities commended his generosity and goodness of heart. Ali Baba did not visit the robber's cave for a whole year, 
as he supposed the other two, whom he could get no account of, might be alive. At the year's end, when he found they had not made any attempt to disturb him, he had the curiosity to make another journey. He mounted his horse, and when he came to the cave he alighted, tied his horse to a tree, then approaching the entrance and pronouncing the words, Open sesame, the door opened. He entered the cavern, and by the condition he found things in, judged that nobody had been there since the captain had fetched the goods for his shop. From this time he believed he was the only person in the world who had the secret of opening the cave, and that all the treasure was at his sole disposal. He put as much gold into his saddlebag as his horse could carry, and returned to town. Some years later he carried his son to the cave, and taught him the secret, which he handed down to his posterity, who, using their good fortune with moderation, lived in great honor and splendor. The Golden Goose the Brothers Grimm. There was a man who had three sons, the youngest of whom was considered very silly, and everybody used to mock him and make fun of him. The eldest son wanted to go out and cut wood at the